Following a mysterious phone call, 18-year-old Colleen Parrish drove away from her family's Broward County home and never returned. Six days later, her missing vehicle was found in a strip mall parking lot beside an abandoned fast food restaurant. There was no evidence, no forensics, nothing to assist in determining where Colleen may have gone nor what had happened. For nearly 23 years, investigators and Colleen's family have fought to try and figure out who would have a reason to want to harm the vibrant and compassionate young woman. Despite exhaustive searches and an investigation involving the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the FBI, Colleen's assailant has never been identified. Was Colleen drawn into a complex situation from which she could not escape? Was she the victim of a random crime? Or might she have been targeted by someone she thought she could trust? Perhaps even a member of her own family. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 229, The Vanishing of Colleen Paris. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we travel to Southern Florida to examine a mysterious disappearance that has endured for more than two decades. 18-year-old Colleen Paris was a bright, vibrant, and loving young woman with her whole life in front of her until one autumn afternoon when she mysteriously vanished. This is episode 229, The Vanishing of Colleen Paris. As the morning sun peeked out from beneath the seemingly endless darkness of the Atlantic Ocean, its ardent glow appeared as little more than a dim blue flicker dancing somewhere out beyond where the blackness of the waves met the vast expanse of the sky. Quickly, vibrant streaks of orange swept out from the east, brilliant embers simmering beneath the rim of graying clouds as they expanded like a sticky fog swallowing more of the blue sky with each passing minute. Even before the sun could ascend to its seat high above the ocean, its heat could already be felt radiating in wet, syrupy breezes along Florida's coast. It was shaping up to be another simmering autumn day in southern Florida, the kind of day that encouraged half the population to hit the beach while convincing the other half to seek shelter in the cool embrace of their air-conditioned homes. For the vast majority of those living on the sunny peninsula's eastern shore, that day would come and pass with little of note, but for one family and those who held them dear, this would be the last morning of their lives that would settle in with any semblance of normalcy. The nightmare began that afternoon, when 18-year-old Colleen Paris drove away from her family's home and never returned. Having saved up some cash, Colleen surprised her parents with tickets to a Florida Marlins baseball game, and they were going to attend alongside her. A few hours before they'd leave for the ballpark, Colleen left the home to run a few quick errands and maybe grab a bite to eat. She planned to return in time to get ready before heading out for the game, but she never did. Nearly 23 years have passed since the intelligent, driven, kind, and caring only daughter of Nancy and Nick Paris drove away into the unknown limbo of being a missing person. But to those who love her, Colleen was so much more than just another name on a list, another photo on an aging flyer. She was the light that filled their lives, the joy that brought them laughter, the troublemaker who earned their ire, and the little girl they cherished raising into an independent, free-spirited, and talented adult. They were optimistic and excited to see what she would do with her future, but before she could step beyond the precipice, someone stole away everything she could ever be and devastated a family who more than two decades later continued to seek their daughter and the one responsible for her disappearance. Colleen Elizabeth Paris was born on the morning of Monday, May 24th, 1982 in Broward County, Florida. Nick and Nancy Paris, a couple living in the city of Plantation, adopted Colleen when she was just weeks old. Thrilled to be parents to a healthy, beautiful baby girl, 
Nick and Nancy immediately fell in love with their new daughter, and together, they would do everything in their power to give her a happy life filled with good memories and endless opportunities. Colleen quickly became the center of their universe, and you couldn't have found a pair of parents more excited to begin the next phase of their journey as now a family of three. Descriptions of Colleen from the time of her childhood throughout her teen years stayed fairly consistent. She was a smart child with a wild love of nature, and whenever she had the opportunity, she'd be out beneath the fiery Florida sun, a whirl of blonde hair, scraped knees, and endless laughter. Colleen's first, and perhaps her truest love, though, was music. Whether she was singing along to her favorite songs or joining the chorus at school, there was something about singing her heart out that always touched something inside of her that others could never define. Of course, most children love to sing, but in Colleen's case, it was more than just an indulgence. She had real talent, and it didn't take much for even the untrained ear to acknowledge that much. She started taking piano lessons at which she excelled and then found her attention drawn towards acting. Colleen imagined growing up to be a famous singer or actress who would take the world by storm. She had massive dreams, but the weight of them never seemed to weigh on her or slow her down. However, the arts were not the only wonders to enchant her developing mind. Sports crept in there too, and Colleen quickly developed an appreciation and affinity for baseball. Her father, Nick, would later tell reporters of the fun they had shared on the ball field, whether they were playing a little catch or cheering on her t-ball team. It was always a good night. As is often the case, Colleen became somewhat rebellious in her teenage years. She didn't go out causing trouble or lash out in school, though. Instead, she leaned more heavily into her free-spirited nature, her state of mind, and reflected her inner rebel through physical changes from altering her style of makeup to dyeing, cutting, and restyling her hair. Colleen never seemed to struggle when it came to expressing herself. She was, in a sense, a contradiction of definitions, simultaneously being described as shy and quiet, but also strong, independent, and forthright. She didn't hesitate to stand up for herself or those she cared about, and while she could be demure, she rarely allowed that to stop her from doing what she believed in or what she really wanted. Many times, those who find themselves more drawn into the creative arts show signs of slack in their academic performance, but this wasn't the case for Colleen. She performed exceedingly well in school and by accounts of friends and family, seemed to have everything together. For a high school student with the whole world ahead of her, she showed no signs of intimidation or hesitance. There was nothing that could stand in her way, and she wasn't going to accept any excuses about what could have been. She was going to make it happen. After attending Nova Middle School, Colleen had moved on to Nova High School, but before she would graduate, she'd make a dramatic shift. Now, I feel compelled to note, while most articles covering this case have selected to report that Colleen dropped out of high school, that isn't really what happened. The older Colleen got, the more she became what friends and family have described as thrifty. She was good at saving her money, and she had a lot of things she wanted to do and places she wanted to see. Opening a bank account, she picked up part-time work and started saving up every dime she could. It was slow going until she discovered a new opportunity for herself. Plantation High School was, at the time, offering a program known as Kaleidoscope, which allowed students the unique opportunity to work during the day and attend classes at night. To Colleen, this was a brilliant idea, and she quickly and eagerly signed on to the program. She took on a lot of jobs at local restaurants, typically filling the position of hostess or waitress. She was a popular young woman who knew what she was doing when it came to hospitality and customer service, which made her a valuable asset and also allowed her to pick up better jobs. Her longest tenure would be as hostess at Hop's Restaurant, Bar, and Brewery, where she was employed for two years. Barry Rosenthal, one of her managers, would later describe her as one of the most reliable and dependable teenagers he'd ever employed. This was a sentiment shared by almost everyone who knew Colleen, noting that she had a maturity beyond her years and always followed through. If she said she'd be there, undoubtedly she would be. 
The year 2000 would bring about several important dates in Colleen's life. Perhaps the one she was looking forward to the most would happen on Wednesday, May 24th, when she celebrated her 18th birthday. The important milestone was marked by friends and family, who noted that Colleen was super excited to take those first steps into adulthood and had only one thing left to wrap up, her night classes at Plantation High School. She couldn't wait to get her diploma, and she was planning on two exciting trips. First, to Colorado, and then a cruise. She bought the tickets for both trips and continued saving cash, with her bank account crossing over $1,000. After turning 18, Colleen remained much the same, but was a little more bold in doing things that previously she might have allowed herself to be talked out of. Her experimentation with hairstyles and colors faded as she finally settled on keeping her blonde locks cut to just below her shoulders, and she had a little red introduced to the color scheme, transforming herself into a strawberry blonde. Next, she turned to the rest of her body. She got her tongue pierced and her navel pierced. She started wanting a tattoo and began planning to get one of a multicolored butterfly on her lower back. Her mother, Nancy, would later note that she and Nick had tried to talk her out of it, and though they thought they had succeeded, one day they saw that tattoo peeking out from beneath her shirt. Suffice it to say, her folks were none too pleased, but she was an adult, and these were her choices to make. By the summer of 2000, Colleen seemed to have it all together. She kept a tight circle of friends, including her bestie, Allie Lopez, who'd she known since she was in grade school. Despite moving on to a different high school from Allie, the two remained nearly inseparable. Colleen also had a boyfriend named Mick Baker. He was a few years older and had a bad boy reputation. Unlike most kids, though, he lived up to it, having had several run-ins with the law. Not exactly the stuff that makes a parent's heart swell, but you try talking a teenager out of love. She had some money in the bank. She'd been working different jobs, including at the Central Park Postal Center, owned by her father. According to Nick, Colleen had come into the job to help out and quickly determined that his systems of organization needed vast improvements. She had a lot of big ideas and was excited to set them in motion, and Nick, for his part, was excited to work with and just to spend time with his only daughter. Sadly, Just a few months after Colleen turned 18, she would disappear, and it would all begin one hot and humid afternoon that fall. The evening of Saturday, September 30th, was meant to be one filled with excitement and laughter. Instead, it would be the beginning of a heartbreaking and frustrating nightmare for everyone who knew and loved Colleen. Weeks earlier, the 18-year-old had gone and purchased tickets to a Marlins Phillies baseball game and invited her parents along, to which they happily agreed. That Saturday, Colleen was off, and so she spent the vast majority of her morning and early afternoon hanging out with her best friend Allie and her boyfriend Mick. Not much has ever been reported about that afternoon, and seemingly, there was nothing out of the ordinary. According to investigators, Mick had to work that day, and so Colleen dropped him off at approximately 1 p.m., this would be the last time the two would ever see one another. After leaving Mick's job, Colleen made the short drive back to her parents' Plantation Acres home to relax for a while before the game. She didn't have any plans, and so around 1.30, she decided to ring her father at work, asking if he could use an extra pair of hands. According to Nick, it was an unusually slow day and so he told his daughter not to bother and to just enjoy the afternoon. Back at the house, it was a fairly average day, with Nancy and Colleen both home and taking it easy. At precisely 2.59 p.m., Colleen's cell phone rang and she picked up. While Nancy was present, she wasn't in the habit of listening in on her daughter's calls, and according to her, Based on the way Colleen had answered, it sounded like it was just a typical call from one of her friends. Moments later, the 18-year-old appeared and told her mother that she was heading out to run some errands and maybe to grab something to eat. The baseball game was set to begin at 7 p.m., and Colleen confirmed that she would be back in time to get ready and make the trip to the ballpark, 
then located 20 minutes away at what was then Joe Robbie Stadium in Miami Gardens. Nancy didn't pay a lot of attention to when Colleen left that afternoon, noting that she was 18 and said she'd be back in a few hours, so she had no reason to question that. However, Nancy would later recall that it was possible Colleen had mentioned driving out to Coral Springs. She left the house that afternoon in her 1994 white Mazda MX-6, and at least for the next few hours, everyone continued on with their lives, completely unaware that they would never see the vibrant, loving, free-spirited young woman ever again. The first indication that anything was wrong came several hours later. When Colleen didn't arrive home by 6 p.m., her parents started to worry. It wasn't like her to not call if she was going to be late. She'd always been so responsible and reliable. At that point, Nick and Nancy started calling their daughter's cell phone, but there was no answer. Now, it's worth noting that this was the year 2000, and so cell phones were a lot less reliable than they are today. It wasn't uncommon for people to lose service or find themselves in dead zones, and so when Colleen didn't answer and hadn't called, her parents tried to calm themselves by assuming it was some type of technology issue. As the night grew later, though, their fears started to mix with parental frustration. Had Colleen gotten together with friends and lost track of time, or was something seriously wrong? There was really no way of knowing for sure, and like so many parents have done before, Nick and Nancy went to bed and planned on giving their daughter a piece of their minds the next morning over breakfast. Tragically, they would never have that opportunity. When the Parises awoke on Sunday morning, they found the house empty. There was no indication that Colleen had come home the night before, and her Mazda was nowhere to be seen. After placing several more unanswered calls to her phone, Nick and Nancy's annoyed concern transformed into full-blown panic. It hadn't been like Colleen to not come home, nor to fail to call. It was absolutely unheard of for her to spend the night out without notifying her parents of those plans. Colleen had worked to maintain a tight circle of friends, so her parents figured one of them might hold the answer to the questions haunting them. Where was Colleen? and who had called her moments before she left the house the previous afternoon. Going through her address book, Nick and Nancy spoke to every one of her friends, and to their shock and surprise, not only did none of them have any idea where she might be, they also all denied having called her the previous day. When asked if they could think of any reason why Colleen may have planned to visit Coral Springs, a city 12 miles north of Plantation, again, no one had any idea. By this point, Nick and Nancy realized something was extremely wrong, and they could do no more to deflect the nagging of their own instincts. They needed to find their daughter as soon as possible, and their next step was to contact the Plantation Police Department to report the 18-year-old missing. Unfortunately, nothing is ever that easy. According to Nick, Convincing the police that their daughter was missing was extremely difficult. When he and Nancy went down to the station to fill out the missing persons report, the police were more of the mindset that Colleen had probably gone off with friends and lost track of time. They advised the Perises that Colleen would probably show back up without knowing she had caused such a stir, and they noted she was 18 years old and there was nothing illegal about her choosing not to come home. Despite this, Police could see that the Parises were extremely upset and they agreed to take the report and had some units sent out to check on all the different routes between Plantation and Coral Springs looking for any sign of Colleen or her car. In addition to this, detectives reached out to the airport and local bus stations, but there were no signs of the 18-year-old. Nick was frustrated with the process, later saying, quote, Colleen had just turned 18, so it's like, Nobody even wanted to talk to me. Too many of the local agencies are too busy. They're not going to go to look for an 18, 19, 25-year-old. If we could have gotten more activity on Sunday, it might have helped. End quote. The next day, when the Parises spoke to police and were once again faced with the possibility that she had left of her own volition, they decided to up the ante. Nick went down to the station again, but he didn't come alone. 
He brought along both Colleen's best friend, Allie, and her boyfriend, Mick. Each of them explained how out of character this was for Colleen and expressed their concern and worry that something terrible may have happened to her. This seemed to jar investigators who accepted that this wasn't just the usual situation of a teenager going off and not telling anyone. The initial detective assigned to the case was Joe Messina, and at least for his part, something felt very off. From day one, he believed Colleen's disappearance was connected to foul play, but at the time, he had no evidence to work with. At the time of his daughter's disappearance, Nick Paris was tied into a lot of community organizations and was known as a neighborhood activist. He was vice president of the Plantation Acres Homeowners Association and was a former president. Through these connections, in addition to family and friends, the Parises began massive community outreach to get Colleen's face and story out to the public. Not the types to sit around and wait for the police to find their daughter. They utilized the machines at Nick's shop to print off hundreds, then thousands of missing persons flyers, and they blanketed the community with them. Nick would later tell the South Florida Sun Sentinel about their progress, saying, quote, I can't imagine there's an area in the city we haven't covered. I just can't tell you how much support there's been from the police department, neighbors, even people in our homeowners association, end quote. Detectives were looking for Colleen, her car, or anyone who may have seen or encountered either one, but they kept coming up empty handed. By Thursday, October 5th, detectives had interviewed and spoken with nearly all of Colleen's friends and family, yet found themselves lacking any solid leads. They reached out to other law enforcement agencies throughout the state and gave them descriptions of both Colleen and the Mazda, but still, there were no sightings. No one could wrap their heads around how this woman and her car had both seemingly disappeared into thin air. And then, the next day, on Friday the 6th, nearly a week since Colleen had last been seen, there was finally a break. A friend of the family was out that day, handing out and putting up flyers when he stumbled upon Colleen's car. The vehicle was located at the Tamarack Square West Shopping Center, a strip mall eight miles from Plantation near the intersection of Pine Island and McNabb Roads, just south of Coral Springs. The man who found the car was working his way towards Coral Springs, the next area the family planned to cover with flyers. This strip mall formed an angular C-shape, running along the northern end of the parking lot, then swinging down the west side. To the east of the parking lot was an abandoned Wendy's fast food restaurant butted up against Pine Island. Colleen's car was parked in a space beside it. While investigators were initially excited by this major discovery, their hope would quickly turn to despair. While the vehicle was found in good working condition with no obvious signs of damage, since it had been outside in the days following Colleen's disappearance, Rain and other weather had destroyed any potential evidence that might have been on the exterior. There were no fingerprints or pieces of forensic evidence collected, and sadly, there wasn't much to work with inside either. Police would later report that the windows had been rolled up and the doors were locked when the car was found. Inside of the vehicle was Colleen's purse, though both her wallet and cell phone were missing. Despite poring over every item found inside the vehicle, police were unable to find any indications as to where Colleen may have gone, what could have happened to her, or who might have been involved. Detectives would later report that they couldn't say with any certainty, but it was possible that the car had been parked in that spot since the day Colleen went missing. While finding the car hadn't provided the brakes everyone was hoping for, it was another piece of evidence that worked to convince investigators that Colleen had not run off. They already felt that was unlikely, given that none of her friends nor her boyfriend had reported her ever mentioning going anywhere. She hadn't touched her bank account, which was still holding around $1,100, and they knew she hadn't taken her car with her now. Much as Colleen's parents had wondered early on, detectives started to believe that the answer to this mystery might be uncovered if only they could determine who had called the 18-year-old in the moments leading up to her disappearance. Cell phone technology and the relationship between law enforcement and telecommunication companies was vastly different in 2000 than it is today. 
it was new ground and a lot of policies and laws hadn't yet been established. This would unfortunately be detrimental to the case. Investigators obtained a warrant, as was necessary at the time, in order to get their hands on records of incoming and outgoing calls. The warrant was then served to the cell phone provider, AT&T, but by the time the company got around to pulling the records, it was already too late. They had been deleted. Without those records and without Colleen's phone, there was no way of knowing who may have called her. In addition to this, they couldn't do much to track the phone either. At the time, GPS technology couldn't triangulate a cell phone's position, and while an outbound call could identify towers nearby, incoming calls played no role in identifying the phone's location. Essentially, without the phone in their possession, there was little they could do to unlock the answer of who had called nor where the phone might be. In hopes of generating new leads, the Parises put together a trust fund from which they would offer rewards for information. Crime Stoppers was offering $1,000 at the time, but the family believed their best hope of finding Colleen would come from a tip, and they figured a large sum might help convince people to call in. October 30th marked a full month since Colleen had last been seen, and while the family was struggling to keep it together, Investigators were also feeling the pressure. Needing assistance in getting something along, the plantation police reached out to both the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the FBI, with both agencies offering different assistance. According to a spokesperson for the Bureau, in addition to other operational and investigative help, they would be sending an agent to plantation to put together a potential profile of an abductor based on the likelihood that Colleen had been the victim of foul play. This same week, the family announced that their reward fund had reached $2,800 and they were still accepting donations. While the FBI were working different angles, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement had their own avenues to pursue. Taking possession of Colleen's address book, they began the long and difficult process of re-interviewing everyone who knew the missing woman but this time with an additional caveat, a polygraph examination. Not only were all of Colleen's close friends being asked to voluntarily take the lie detector test, her entire family were also involved in the process. Asked about the status of those tests, Tony Pineda, lead investigator for the FDLE, stated he could issue no comment on an ongoing investigation. Wanting to do more to keep Colleen's name in the headlines, the family, with the assistance of some of her friends, put together a website which provided images of Colleen, a description of the events leading up to her disappearance, and where people could call in with what tips they might have. Unfortunately, despite all of their efforts and the push of multiple law enforcement agencies, the year of 2000 would come to its conclusion with no news, no solid leads, and no developments. It would be the first Christmas in nearly 20 years that Nick and Nancy had spent without their daughter, and their pain was reflected in their lack of decorations or celebration. Nick would later tell the Miami Herald, quote, Each day, it gets harder to believe. This was the roughest Christmas I've ever had, all the way around. End quote. Unfortunately, as the calendar flipped over from 2000 to 2001, each passing day seemed to move Colleen's case further into cold case files. May 24th marked what should have been her 19th birthday, but instead of celebrating together, her family grieved. Both Nick and Nancy threw themselves into their jobs, finding that a distracted mind was easier to manage. In the nine months that passed, the Parises had managed to increase their reward fund to a solid $10,000, a number they certainly expected to bring in at least a few calls. And while there were some tips, none of them led investigators any closer to Colleen. September of that year brought with it the grim reality of a full year gone without Colleen, without answers, and without anything to really work with for either the family or detectives. While lead investigator Joe Messina remained dedicated to the case, continuing to follow up on every lead he found, no matter how small it might be, 
It was Colleen's family who suffered in the emotional limbo of not knowing. They tried to balance their fears with hope, but while that had worked well in the early days, the more time had passed, the more difficult it was to suppress those darker thoughts. Nick explained to the Miami Herald, saying, quote, We've now gone through one complete set of holidays, Christmas, her birthday, my birthday, and we haven't heard from her. We can't stop looking until we know one way or another. In the back of my mind, I'm expecting the worst, but I can't stop hoping and looking. It's the only way I can keep my sanity. I have to keep moving. End quote. Over the course of the next few years, the case really began to fall off. Investigators would report receiving less than 10 calls per year about the case, and of those 10 or so, none provided information solid enough to answer any of the growing list of questions haunting the case. For the Parises, they focused on the sorrow and the grief and turned it into activism. They fought tooth and nail to keep Colleen's name in the headlines to get her story out nationwide but they found larger publications and crime shows were disinterested. People Magazine didn't want to write a story about the case and post pictures, and America's Most Wanted elected not to feature the story. Frustrated, Nick explained that it seemed his missing daughter just didn't have a controversial enough hook, as he told the Herald, quote, She's missing, but she wasn't a young child, she wasn't pregnant, and she wasn't with a congressman. End quote. Instead, the family turned to the kindness of friends and strangers, truck drivers and travelers, giving them stacks of flyers to put up at truck stops, restaurants, and everywhere in between as they made their way across the country. Publicly, they were on fire and fighting with everything they had for their daughter. In private, they suffered in their own personal ways. Colleen's room in the family home remained untouched, an unchanging memorial to a lost child. Neither Paris could truly answer why they had left the room that way. Was it to commemorate the life of their daughter or because in their heart of hearts, they hoped she'd come walking back in that door? To ask parents in that position, it was likely a combination of both. Nancy questioned the choice herself when speaking to reporters, saying, quote, I go in her room and look around, then walk out. I feel like we have to know something before we box anything up. Is it two years or five years? I'll know when the time is right, and that time may never come. End quote. In September of 2003, America's Most Wanted came back around and decided they did want to run a segment on Colleen's disappearance for what would mark three years since she was last seen. Detective Messina flew up to Bethesda, Maryland, where America's Most Wanted had their headquarters, so he could be present in the call center after the segment aired. 91 calls came in from viewers that first night, though they didn't offer any solid insights into Colleen's disappearance. Even when the number hit 200, the calls were a wide assortment of alleged sightings stretching from Florida to California and even into the Bahamas. Messina had hoped for more, as had the Parises, but sadly, the nationwide coverage hadn't shaken loose any local mouths. Asked what he believed might have happened to his daughter, Nick was forced to confront the harsh reality that three years without her had brought into the light. He would tell the Sentinel, quote, I don't think anything good, but I'm going to keep looking, keep hoping. The fact that there was nothing that day, that no one saw anything happen, keeps that hope alive that maybe she just took off for whatever reason. My wife just figures that Colleen is going to call one day or show up one day, end quote. The next few years fell like dominoes in slow motion. Each day dragged on painfully long as Nick and Nancy tried their best to keep their lives together, poured their energy into trying to find their daughter, and struggled to maintain their grip on hope for the future. In September of 2004, after four years of sitting untouched in their garage, the couple made the painful decision to sell Colleen's Mazda. It wasn't doing anyone any good just sitting there, a constant reminder of their loss. While the couple had kept their daughter's bedroom exactly as she had left it, 
a pipe burst a few months later and destroyed the room and much of its contents. Another unfortunate turn of events, another seemingly unstoppable heartbreak. The case continued to grow cold. The last major developments, if you can call them that, were revealed to the public in 2007, seven years after Colleen disappeared. That year, for the first time, Nick and Nancy made the decision to travel and spend time with family rather than being home for that terrible anniversary. For all those years, the question of who called Colleen that afternoon had haunted the family and investigators. As it turned out, Colleen's best friend, Allie, had her own ideas about who the mystery caller may have been. According to her, when she had become aware that Colleen was missing, the first thing she did was call her cell phone. While she didn't get an answer, she didn't exactly need one for what she had in mind. Being as close with Colleen as she was, Allie knew her best friend's PIN code for her voicemail, and so she decided to punch it in. The automated voice explained that there were three unheard messages, and Allie listened to all of them. She would later tell police that all three calls came from the same person, Colleen's uncle, 49-year-old Mitchell Radisher. Radisher was, at the time, married to Nick's sister. Allie told police that the messages from Radisher were reminding Colleen to meet him in a parking lot in Coral Springs the afternoon of her disappearance. Unfortunately, according to Allie, she didn't realize the seriousness of the situation at the time and had assumed that Colleen was off doing her own thing and lost track of time. So, rather than saving the messages, when Allie realized Colleen hadn't yet heard them, she went ahead and deleted them, something she would later describe as a huge mistake and I would say is a dramatic understatement. She would later tell police that she had underestimated the seriousness of the situation and deleted the messages purely because she didn't like Radisher and didn't think Colleen should be spending time around him. Unfortunately, authorities were unable to retrieve the voicemails and therefore could not prove Radisher had called her that afternoon. However, it did give them a curious person to look into. Given the lack of signs of a struggle and where the car had been found, police were already following the theory that Colleen had gone along with someone that she had thought she could trust. Unfortunately, investigators hit a dead end when it came to Radisher. Outside of his one preliminary interview with detectives, he refused to speak to them again. When the Florida Department of Law Enforcement conducted their polygraph examinations, Radisher was the only close family member who refused to participate. Allie would later tell police that the reason she disliked Radisher was because he had been supplying Colleen with drugs, primarily LSD and ecstasy. In addition to this, there was something about him that creeped her out, and she felt like Radisher may have had an interest in his adopted niece, sexually. In addition to these claims, Allie told police that Colleen had been so desperate to make money she had considered taking part in some pornographic films and, reportedly, Allie told the police that the porn concept was Radisher's idea and he had offered to help put it together. When asked about all of this by police, Radisher denied all of the accusations, though he did say that he offered to help get Colleen a gig modeling lingerie. For their part, detectives noted that while they had looked hard at Radisher, they'd uncovered no tangible evidence to link him to Colleen's disappearance. Due to the dramatic absence of any evidence, they could not at that time list Radisher as a suspect. The Parises would later note that Radisher's behaviors caused a lot of tension inside of the family, and once Radisher stopped cooperating, Nick and Nancy stopped communicating with him, essentially cutting him out from the family. It was another painful situation for which there were no easy answers. A few months later, in December, Nick and Nancy made the difficult decision to go before a judge who officially declared Colleen deceased. It was a horrible step forward, but a necessary one. Following the judge's ruling, the Parises quickly got back into action trying to get to the truth. Their primary focus became obtaining information from anyone who could answer one simple question. 
Who called Colleen that hot afternoon in September of 2000? Who convinced her to leave the comfort and safety of her family home only for her to vanish? Her car found abandoned nearly a week later. Nancy and Nick cashed out Colleen's college fund, and then they added in her life insurance. The combined money was added to their reward fund, offering all of it to anyone who could answer that one simple question. Nick explained, quote, The total reward at this point is $30,000. We want to know who called her at 3 p.m. Saturday, September 30th. Make one anonymous call and you can collect it all. End quote. To this day, that money has never been claimed, and the identity of the mystery caller remains uncertain. When last seen, Colleen Elizabeth Paris was described as being a white female with strawberry blonde hair and hazel eyes, standing five feet two inches tall and weighing approximately 95 pounds. Her hair is naturally curly, but she often straightens it. She has a tattoo of a large multicolored butterfly on the small of her back. She also has Chinese characters tattooed on her right ankle and a band around the left. Her ears, tongue, and navel are pierced, and at the time of her disappearance, she smoked menthol cigarettes, usually Newports. At the time of her disappearance, Colleen was 18 years old. And if alive today, she would now be 41. For nearly 23 years, the mystery of Colleen's disappearance has haunted her family and investigators. A brilliant, talented, sweet young woman drove away from her family's home and never returned. Despite the exhaustive efforts of investigators, friends, and her family, the truth of Colleen's fate has never been uncovered, and the questions surrounding her disappearance continue to go unanswered. While some believe Colleen's case is one which will remain unsolved for many years to come, investigators and her family are convinced someone out there knows the truth, and they're hoping to pay that person $30,000 for just one answer. A young woman makes plans with her family, heads out to run a few errands, and never comes home. Despite an expansive search, a highly motivated community, thousands of flyers, the involvement of three law enforcement agencies, and a substantial reward, more than 20 years later, we still don't have any real answers. As we often see in cases like these, where evidence is dramatically lacking, there aren't a ton of theories to examine or analyze. Actually, when it comes down to Colleen's case, there's really only one vague theory considered. Foul play. To the credit of investigators, this was never a case where they firmly believed that Colleen had run away or chose to disappear. Detective Joe Messina was on the case from the first day and made it adequately clear that he believed Colleen had been the victim of foul play. The problem was... They had no evidence to support that theory, let alone to give them a lead on a direction to look or a suspect to pursue. From their bad luck when it came to her cell phone records to the sheer lack of any forensic evidence recovered from her car, detectives were behind the eight ball to begin with, and they never managed to work their way around it. So that doesn't leave us with a ton of different avenues to explore here. There's no point in debating the fleeting possibility that Colleen ran off somewhere or is alive out there, somehow having managed to live in hiding for more than two decades. No one who knew her believes that would have ever crossed her mind. Her family meant too much to her. Nearly 23 years have passed and neither her bank account nor social security card have ever been touched, so that leaves a handful of theories, all of which fall under the banner of foul play. The two most frequently discussed have involved Colleen falling victim to someone. The question, of course, remains whether this was someone she knew, someone she trusted, or perhaps a random encounter. Rather than split these two apart, I think it makes the most sense to just move forward through what we know of the case and see what makes sense and what doesn't. According to what we know of that Saturday afternoon, Colleen spent the early part of the day with her best friend and then her boyfriend, who she dropped off at work around 1 p.m. 
After that, she called her father to see if he needed any help down at his business, and when Nick said no, she proceeded on to her family's Plantation Acres home. For the next few hours, she hung around the house, not really doing much of anything. In a few hours, they were supposed to be attending the baseball game that Colleen had purchased tickets to, so it was kind of a lazy day. Then, according to Nancy, Colleen's phone rang around 3 p.m., and minutes later, she emerged and explained that she was heading out to run some errands, maybe grab a bite to eat, but she'd be back in time for the game. At that point, Colleen drove away in her white Mazda and vanished into the scorching Florida sunlight. What happened that afternoon remains unknown, but her car would be found six days later, sitting next to an abandoned Wendy's in a strip mall north of Plantation and very close to Coral Springs. Now, I should note that in initial news reports, there is no mention of Coral Springs. Whether or not Colleen specifically mentioned this area or it came out afterwards in reaction to the alleged voicemails, I can't say for certain. All I can tell you is that for months, there is no mention of Colleen saying where she's going. And then, almost out of nowhere, Coral Springs is mentioned as though it's always been that way. Now, if we're looking at this from the angle that Colleen was abducted or killed by a total stranger, there's a lot of questions about that phone call that won't make any sense. We know the call came in. We know from Nancy's statements that, based on what she casually overheard, it just sounded like it was a typical call from one of Colleen's friends. Nothing was said to raise any suspicion or curiosities, and apparently there were no changes in tone or volume to lead Nancy to think it was anything out of the ordinary. But this call is clearly the catalyst that causes the 18-year-old to leave the house. I suppose the most obvious statement is, a total stranger couldn't possibly have had Colleen's number, and even if they did, why would she agree to meet them anywhere? That just doesn't make any sense. So you have to do what most people have done. You assume the call is from someone Colleen knew, whether that was a coworker, friend, or family member. This raises the second big problem. If this call did come from someone in Colleen's life and investigators have interviewed absolutely everyone they can think of that she even remotely knew, how have they failed to identify the caller? Either someone they've never spoken to, maybe someone they couldn't even locate or someone that's never been mentioned to them made that call, or it was someone they did interview, someone who claims to care about Colleen and wants her brought home safely, but is lying. There's really no other possibilities here. Now, being that no one has ever come forward to admit to making the call that afternoon, you're kind of left to assume that the caller played some role in Colleen's disappearance, whether it was direct involvement or maybe leading her into some kind of a trap or ambush. At the end of the day, you have to ask yourself why. Why would someone do this? But there's never going to be an answer that suffices. Hell, even if you manage to positively identify the suspect and he admitted his involvement, there's never going to be a reason given that justifies ending a young woman's life before it's even had a chance to begin. Based on what little police have said about the car, it sounds like they believe it had probably been parked in the parking space since the day of the disappearance. It has, in the years since, been theorized that whatever happened to Colleen happened quickly after she exited her vehicle. Now, I haven't found any solid statements or information from either the family or law enforcement on this, but it seems almost suggested, if you read between the lines, that they believe Colleen was the one who parked her car there and it wasn't someone else. Whether or not this was a usual spot where she met up with someone previously and felt safe, no one knows for sure. But it does seem apparent that after parking, Colleen got out of her car and likely into someone else's. The only items missing were her wallet and phone. While the car wasn't able to provide police with, well, really anything of value, we can account for what wasn't found. No blood, no bodily fluids, no signs of a struggle, nothing to suggest that someone else drove the car or that Colleen was forcibly removed from it. So this seems to fall in line with the idea that she may have driven to that shopping center to meet with someone she knew, more than likely the same person who called her. So the $64,000 question is, why did this happen? 
presuming that this is someone she knows and someone she trusts, then it's someone she's met with before. Believing that the spot in the strip mall was a predetermined location, maybe even one that had been used before, what could have gone so wrong that afternoon that Colleen never made it home? That's the answer everyone would love to find. So we come around to the place where I can no longer avoid it. And we're just going to have to talk about Ali Lopez deleting those voicemails and Mitchell Radisher, Colleen's uncle, allegedly being involved in a series of unsavory activities as pertains to his young adopted niece. A large part of the reason I'm less than thrilled to get into these details is because of their unreliability. Now, I have no reason to question Allie's statements about the voicemails, but because they were deleted and we can't confirm through a second source what was said on them, it's difficult to buy. Not that I think it's all that unlikely. We've seen quite a few cases in recent years that go deep into the horror and depravity that some family members will put others through. For me, it's more a matter of what could be utilized to obtain warrants or make arrests. If these voicemails existed and they were from Radisher and he was telling Colleen to meet him at a Coral Springs area strip mall, they'd be incredibly damning, and it isn't difficult to imagine investigators would have been on him from the get-go. However, not existing, only in statements made by Ali Lopez, they are little more than hearsay, and there's really nothing we can do with them, much like the investigators. Lopez went on to accuse Radisher of not only leaving those voicemails, but also of being, for lack of a better term, a creep. She says that Radisher, 49 at the time, was supplying Colleen with drugs, specifically LSD and ecstasy. Now, maybe it's just the type of person that I am, but I find supplying your younger relatives with powerful drugs to be extremely disturbing behavior. Maybe even it was part of a plan to groom Colleen a plan which may have been going on for a long time. Unfortunately, without deeper insights into whatever the relationship was between Colleen and Radisher, it's hard to know what the hell might have been going on here. Then when you factor in the information about potentially making a pornographic film, it doesn't take a Harvard mind to know something was very, very wrong. The problem is, where do you go from there? Radisher won't speak to investigators, refuse to take a polygraph, and without some kind of evidence or probable cause, he can't be compelled to talk to the police. Now, in fairness, that in and of itself is a giant red flag. Look, I've made it clear over the years that I'm not a proponent of polygraph examinations. They're unreliable to the point that they are inadmissible in court as evidence, which is enough for me to consider them mostly junk science. At the end of the day, you're talking about computers and technology, and it's kind of a situation of garbage in, garbage out. So I never begrudge someone refusing to take these tests. But this case is a little different. Were I pulled over by the police one day, or if they came knocking on my door and they wanted me to take a polygraph to prove my innocence, I tell them to stick it. It would do nothing to improve my situation, because if I passed, they just assume I beat the test. And if I failed, even if I was innocent, it would just push them to keep digging into me and pursuing me as their prime suspect. I asked a lawyer friend once about taking a polygraph and she laughed and said she'd never advise a client to go along with that. I think there's a difference here though. This wasn't a random case. This wasn't some random crime. This was his niece who disappeared. Dozens of polygraphs were given in this case to everyone in the immediate family, to all of her close friends, and the only person who refused was her uncle. Now, that may be some kind of confirmation bias, but even to a complete outsider, that smells extremely suspicious. But then you're stuck. What more can you do with that? Hell, detectives found themselves so hamstrung by the turning of events as relates to the voicemails that they can't even officially refer to Radisher as a suspect. He talked to police once and never spoke with them again, despite successive attempts. The only time he's ever spoken publicly about the case was when America's Most Wanted covered it in September of 2003. And let me make this really clear. If you didn't think Radisher was suspicious before, 
the way he spoke on America's Most Wanted would no doubt make you think this guy had to be up to something. Finding old episodes of America's Most Wanted can be really difficult. There's not a ton of them floating around on the internet, and even what old episodes can be found are usually from people who taped them at home and uploaded them with questionable quality. While I did manage to track down a transcript that shows part of Radisher's interview, I couldn't find the full video clip. The show would utilize former members of law enforcement for situations like this, and Radisher was interviewed by a former homicide detective. When the detective noted that he would be asking some of the same questions police had probably already asked, Radisher replied, quote, you know, I would have gone to alibis.com if I knew I needed one, end quote. When the detective asked why he refused to take the polygraph test, Radisher replied, quote, push me, I push back, end quote. Now, this detective was also certified to administer polygraph exams. Given that he had Radisher on the spot, he decided to ask him if he would be willing to take one. Radisher confirmed that he might consider doing it, but when the detective stated they could do it right then and there, Radisher changed his mind, saying he didn't want to be blindsided. The final question asked was whether or not Radisher was involved in any way whatsoever with Colleen's disappearance. This was his answer. Quote, no, can't tell you any better than that. No, you're looking right in my eyes right now, and I hope you're seeing the truth. You know I'm not looking to the left and trying not to look to the right, because I want you to look at my eyes and see that, you know, there's some semblance of truth there. End quote. That's it. His niece disappeared nearly 23 years ago, and in all of that time, even in the hours and days immediately following the vanishing, he had nothing to say. It doesn't sound like he was out there helping to pass out flyers, or that he was working his ass off to bring attention to the case, or even to find his niece. Total strangers handed out flyers across the country. People who never met Colleen donated money to reward funds offered in her name. Yet, her own uncle can't be bothered to do anything more than make half-assed, insensitive jokes about alibis and pushing back like he's some kind of badass? Does that make him guilty? Certainly not of having been involved in Colleen's disappearance, but I don't think he'd struggle to get a few votes for scumbag of the year. He certainly got mine. Unfortunately, that's where this case has remained for the vast majority of these last 23 years. A stunning lack of evidence or suspects, one particular person with questionable behaviors who, short of the deletion of a few voicemails, might have found himself in a completely different situation. Maybe if phone technology had been more advanced, we'd know for sure. To date, $30,000 offered for information in this case has never been cashed in. $30,000 can be a life-changing amount of money for a lot of people out there, and it wouldn't take much to earn it. All you'd have to do is either provide information about who made the call to Colleen that Saturday afternoon or provide verifiable information that helps lead to an arrest or to Colleen. Hell, you could do that in less than five minutes. Is that not worth $30,000 to you? Because unless someone comes forward, new evidence is found, or Colleen herself is located, this case will remain open, unsolved, and growing cold. If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Colleen Paris, there are many newspaper archives and forums discussing her case. For this episode, the two primary sources most helpful were the South Florida Sun Sentinel and the Miami Herald. If you have any information about the vanishing of Colleen Paris, please contact the Plantation Police Department at 954-797-2100. Her case is number 0046-0010. What do you believe happened? 
tweet me at Trace Ev Pod, email me at Trace Evidence Pod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank some of our amazing Patreon producers Andrew Guarino, Ann Bertram, Alicia Lorraine, Camelia Tyler, Christine Greco, Danny Renee, Dorothy, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Buttram, Diane Dyson, Eloan Meyer, Guillerme Pinto, Jennifer Winkler, Julie Mangano, Justin Snyder, Kara Moreland, KY, Kelly Michelle, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B, Lisa Hobson, Madison Mahoulier, Melissa Brekhuizen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Nicole Kingbird, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Eve, Stephanie Joyner, and Tom Radford. I can't begin to express just how much all of your support means to me, as without all of you, trace evidence would not be possible. If you're interested in learning more about this case or other cases featured on the show, please visit trace-evidence.com. There you can find case breakdowns, all social media links, merchandise shops, case descriptions, media, and options for donating, including PayPal and Patreon, should you wish to support the show. This concludes our coverage of the September 2000 vanishing of Colleen Paris. 23 years is a long time to wait for answers, especially when everyone knows that there's someone out there who can supply them. It's just a question of how much could $30,000 really help you. I want to thank you again for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.